another great show brought to you by the Law of Attraction Radio Network. The Think, Believe, and Manifest Show with author, master trainer, and certified dream coach, Constance Arnold. Join us every week as we bring you life-changing information that will empower your life. And here's Constance. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Law of Attraction Radio Network. And, of course, I'm Constance Arnold, uh, your most gracious host, and I am broadcasting live today with just a little touch of Southern flavor. And, you know, I'm so excited that you've joined me. And I would just like to give a special shout-out to listeners from all over the world, from Australia, the U.K., Ireland, Uganda, and, of course, my faithful listeners in the U.S. and Canada. And I am so excited about the unlimited possibilities that exist in your life today. And, you know, I say every week, if you are listening to this show or to this podcast, I know that the Spirit of God has attracted you here to listen so that you can really receive answers that you've been seeking for. Well, how are you doing today? I'm doing really great here in Hotlanta, and can you believe it is already August? I just cannot believe it, and I have a couple of questions for you. What are you doing differently in your life? You know I'm going to ask you that. How are you thinking and believing differently, and how do you need to shift or change, or what do you need to shift or change in order to create and manifest your dream life? And our special guest today certainly will be answering some of those questions. Well, as I said earlier, I'm doing really great, really excited about my life, excited about your life. And I'm just really grateful for all of you who send me those wonderful emails and you're letting me know just how much this show is radically changing your life. <clears throat> and I especially want to give a special shout out to my new listeners in Raleigh, North Carolina. That's right. I had the wonderful opportunity of spending a day there uh, doing some leadership training and just really working with a powerful group of people and that was my first time in Raleigh and I thoroughly enjoyed it and I told them that I was going to give them a special shout out so that is what I'm doing uh, this evening and uh, speaking of speaking I've had a couple of you email me about uh, my speaking and of course you know I would love to partner with you to help create uh, an empowering event for your company so just email me at Constance at fulfillingyourpurpose.com I think that this month I'm going to Birmingham, Alabama, and uh, I think next month I'm going to California, and then I'm going to be visiting Montgomery, Alabama. So contact me at Constance at FulfillingYourPurpose.com. And additionally, next week, guess what? I'm going to be teaching on 100 Ways to Create and Manifest Wealth, Prosperity, and Abundance in Your Life. So I want you to make sure you tune in for that show. But today, my very special guest is Simon T. Bailey, and Simon is going to be talking to us about how to shift from average to brilliant. And so after we listen to these quick commercials, I will be right back with Simon. You're listening to Law of Attraction Radio Network, enhancing the well-being of millions of listeners worldwide. LOARadioNetwork.com is heard through 25 different internet radio stations as well as iTunes Radio, Stitcher.com, and our mobile apps. The Law of Attraction Radio Network, your trusted source of daily inspiration at LOARadioNetwork.com. I am thrilled to announce our presenters on our upcoming Cruise of a Lifetime on December 13th to the Mayan Ruins. The phenomenal Lee Harris is flying in from the UK to give us channeled information right in Tulum. And shaman Stefan Wills, flying in from Spain, will be doing incredible meditations and emotional clearing work. We have one of the most dynamic speakers and self-development experts, Constance Arnold, coming in to help us release the past. And hugely popular astrologer Gene Wiley flying in as well, telling us what the stars mean in 2013 all designed to give you incredible insight and advice 
on how to create the best in 2013. So come aboard our high energy trip. Time is of the essence, the sign of today to get the best rates, best cabins, and best cabin mates. Go to lawofattractioncruise.com. Well, let me tell you a little bit about our very special guest today, uh, Simon T. Bailey. Simon is a compelling thought catalyst, uh, and uh, he has certainly carried his message to more than one million people. He has a very dynamic speaking style, and he has been uh, nominated as one of the top 25 speakers shaping his profession. He is the author of Release Your Brilliance, and it was ranked number 17 out of the top 100 books being used by Corporate America. I've read that book. But he has a new book out, uh, The Vujia Day Moment, Shift from Average to Brilliant. And I've read the book, and it's really powerful. Uh, The first time that I saw Simon, I was in Atlanta, Georgia. He was the... Um, the main speaker at a conference, I think it was a business conference in Atlanta, and I was one of the speakers in the breakout conference, and I was in awe of this man's brilliance and of his spirituality and of the insight that God had given him about how to live an abundant and a brilliant life. And, of course, I stood in the long line, and I said, I've got to have you on my show and he, he's been on my show before, but he, he has a brand new book out, and I'm so excited to have him again tonight. So Simon T. Bailey, welcome to the, to the Law of Attraction Radio Network. Thank you so much, Constance. Thank you for having me. Good to be with you. So what great city are you calling from? I'm calling from the warm city of Orlando, <laughs> Florida. <laughs> and I just love your laugh, and I, I love your new book, but for our listeners, uh, tell our listeners a little bit about who you are. So I'm originally from Buffalo, New York. Uh, my father was a Jamaican immigrant to our country 50 years ago, moved from Buffalo to Atlanta. I don't know if you knew that or not, but I lived I in Atlanta. I did not. Yeah, I lived in Atlanta from 1986 to 1992. And then in 1992, I moved to Orlando, where I've been here for the last 20 years. Wow, and you've made quite a mark, not only in Orlando, but all over the world. Well, it's fun, and every day on top of the ground is a brilliant day. It is, and so I just finished rereading your book again, and I'm really excited about it. So let's get started. And I hope I'm not going to say the day, the day for you moment, but it's the Vujia Day moment. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah Vujia Day. Just think <laughs> Vujia <deja> Day. <laughs> yeah, just think deja vu reversed. So okay. Vujia Day. <laughs> Vujia, Vujia <laughs> Day moment. Shift from average to brilliant. What an interesting title. Why did you write this book? So when I looked around the world, I discovered that deja vu means you've already seen it, been Mm -hmm. there, done it, got the T-shirt. Bouja day means you've never seen it, but you intend to create it and go there and make it happen. Uh, and, And part of what drove me to that is I was in Paris, and I decided to climb the stairs of the Eiffel Tower as versus taking the elevator. And what I realized is halfway getting up the stairs, I'm like, this is crazy. I should have took the elevator, the easier way, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I want to turn around and go back. (laughs) And and (laughs) then I said, no, wait a minute. Let me just keep going. And the more I began to climb the stairs and put one foot in front of the other, I realized, you know what, I could do this. But it was easier for me to turn around because that's the deja vu. That's like, okay, I could just turn around and and be done with this. But the Vujia Day says, wait a minute, I can move forward if I decide to take the action to create a better tomorrow. Wow, that's very interesting. And, you know, there have been so many shifts going on globally, shifts financially, in relationships, the way we um, look at the whole universe. So, Let's talk about shifting. Why do we need to make one, and and how can we begin to do that? Why shift? Well, first of all, the world that we have once known has forever changed, and it's not going back. 
Some people are waiting for uh, the good times to come back, the heyday of 2006, 2007, uh, where money flowed freely, jobs were plentiful, uh, anything you wanted to go and buy, you could. Uh, life was just great and wonderful. And the reason we've needed to shift, because according to futurists and, and people who study trends, as of 2006, we entered into the shift age. So within the last 100 years, we've gone from an agricultural society to an industrial age to the knowledge age to what many are calling the shift age. And in this shift age, you have to become the CEO of You Incorporated, and you cannot wait for the other shoe to drop and wait for your, your, yourself to be discovered or for your business to grow, or for your life to go in another direction, you have to get up off your blessed assurance and say, <laughs> how am I going to make it happen for myself? Because it's not going to happen in D.C., and it's not going to happen in our nation's capital. It's not going to happen um, at 10 Downing Street in London. It's up to us to say, what are we going to do to have the Bouja Day moment and create our future? And, you know, Jack Canfield was recently on my show, and he talked about taking 100% full responsibility for our lives, and that's what it sounds like that you are certainly talking about here tonight. Absolutely, totally. So you talk about seven steps to becoming a shifter. So let's talk about those seven steps in depth. And number one is see differently. Yeah, so see differently has everything to do with if I continue to see things the way they always have been, I'm the last to see the future differently. So let me give you an example. In 1979, Steve Jobs, at the age of 25, walked into the Xerox Research Facility in Palo Alto, California. And at that time, Xerox had this uh, technology whereby they could move things around graphically uh, on a computer screen. Well, here's the, the irony of the entire situation. Uh, Steve Jobs saw how he could put a computer on every desk because of what Xerox was doing. But Xerox only saw copiers. They didn't see computers and how they could revolutionize the world. So how is it that two people could be looking at the same thing but arrive at a whole different viewing point? When you think about that, most of the changes and in innovative things that have come about happen because someone saw something differently. If you think about some of the great inventions within the last 100 years, if you think about even our food choices, you know, you think about Chipotle, you know, which originally was owned by McDonald's, and you're like, oh my goodness, is there room for another restaurant? Absolutely. They have absolutely found their niche. They have taken off. If you think about Google just some, you know, 10, 10 years ago, yeah, we were Googling, but look at how far Google has come in just a short amount of time, and now they're getting ready to launch Google.tv. So it's the ability to see what everybody else sees, but to understand that differently. Now, those are business examples. What about everyday examples in our lives? Well, when you think about the job that you have right now, how has that job changed, and what are you doing to disrupt how you do your job, or if you're in business for yourself, how much has your market changed, especially those in the real estate industry? How homes have been sold in the past have forever changed. Yes, it will be one-to-one, -one, that person, that realtor selling to the, the particular potential buyer, but now buyers are going to be a lot more educated about interest rates, about the mortgage products that are being offered to them because many people are underwater in their houses. So seeing differently really starts with three questions. Why are we doing this? What can I do? Is there a better way? Those are the three questions that I want everyone listening to us from around the world to begin to ask themselves. Is there a better way? What can I do? And why are we doing this? Well, you know, uh, under number one, you talked about rear view mirror questions that we need to ask ourselves. Why mm -hmm. do we need to do that? 
because those rear view mirror questions allows us to take a snapshot back in time to say, okay, what did I see there? What did I miss? What questions should I be asking differently so that I can better move into my future? So, so those rear view mirror questions allows you to take a snapshot of yesterday so it propels you to continue to move forward in your future. Why do you think, Simon, that some people see and other people don't? It all comes down to a matter of perspective. Uh, like I'll give you an example. A man moved into a town, uh, and he found a local uh, pub to go to in that town. And when he walked into the, the bar, he, in the pub, he asked the bartender, so what are the people like that live here? And the bartender said, what are the people like where you came from? And he said, oh, my goodness, they were miserable, they are horrible, they are awful. And she said, uh, and so he tells her this, and she's tell, he's uh, telling her this, and, and she said, you know what, you'll probably find those same people in this town. Mm -hmm. They'll be awful, they'll be miserable. Well, then a few minutes later, another person walks into the, the bar and says, hey, what are the people like in this town? And she says, what were the people like in the town that you left? And he said, oh, they were awesome, they were amazing, they were friendly, they'll go above and beyond, they'll do whatever you need them to do. You know, people are very uh, giving. And she said, you'll probably find those same type of people here. Well, the first guy said, well, wait a minute, what is, what is this town really like? And why didn't you tell me the same thing? And she said, because it's all a matter of perception. Mm -hmm. So the reason many times people don't practice that is because they perceive a matter differently. It all comes down to how you perceive it and how you see it. Wow. And number two is harness the power of you, ink. So the whole thought process behind that is based on uh, the research out that looks at uh, General Electric and when they hired a number of people back in uh, the early 80s and then they laid them off. But And their goal was to become more of a knowledge management type of company. And then they rehired. But when they did the deeper dive, they rehired people not for what they could do with their hands, but how they could use their minds. So right now, I am encouraging people to become the CEO of You Incorporated. You need to understand what's my skill set, what's my experience, what's my education, what's my relationships, and how do I become a mini brand within a brand? And if I work in a company, how do I have my own personal board of directors that challenges me to add value, step up, make a difference, be personally accountable for what I'm supposed to deliver? If you're in business for yourself, how do you reimagine how you're engaging the team of people that you work with or vendors or suppliers that you have to engage in order to deliver a, a product to a customer? Or if you're self-employed as the CEO of Me Incorporated, harnessing the power of Me Inc., how do I continue to think differently and create a moment for customers where they're like, wow, that was so amazing. And that customer becomes an unofficial marketing department for my product or service. So give me an example of someone, maybe someone who you've coached or even yourself, who harnessed the power of you, Inc. One of the people that I coached uh, called me not too long ago saying, hey, I want to move up uh, the food chain. I, want, I see there's a director's role available inside the company. How do I begin to position myself to get it? So what the first thing I said is we need to create a campaign committee. Hmm. We need to ensure that there are three to five people who speak well of your personal brand. You need to take them to lunch. You need to take them uh, and, and find out uh, what they think of you. But more importantly, not just going to ask them for something. You need to go and, and really take the posture of what can I do to help them as well. The second thing I said, you need to begin to look at all of the accomplishments that you've made in the organization, and that one's pretty simple, but also thinking about if you were to get this role within the first 90 days, what would you do differently? What would you do that would be unique? 
that would cause this position to and, and the leader to say, wow, we made the best decision in hiring you. So, Simon, do you believe that, that all of us have, uh, I guess, that entrepreneur spirit on the inside of us or, you know, that special niche that God has, has given us that we could really market to serve others but also to bring wealth into our own lives? I believe that all of us have a certain something in us, and that can either push us to be an intrapreneur working inside a business or an entrepreneur creating our own income. And you talked about thinking inside the box. And, you know, we're always taught to think outside of the box. What did you mean by that? <laughs> So, so you know, the whole research of thinking inside the box really came about because there's this explosion of people say, think outside the box. And the whole, the whole term of out-of-the-box thinking came from solutions to the so-called nine-dot problem, where there are three rows of three dots, and the problem is to connect all the dots with just four lines without lifting the pen. So the solution lies in when you draw a line that goes outside the ima imaginary box that is formed by those nine dots, okay? So, so what's happened is thinking outside the box has come to mean that you're thinking of a solution that is somehow outside of what you already know and do and coming up with something totally new. So the reason I wanted people to think inside the box is because the answer is in you, not right. outside of you. So you have to begin to say, if the answer is in me, how do I get it out? You've got to ask questions because the question is in the answer. So there are four questions to become a person who begins to think inside the box. Question number one, where have I been? Question number two, why am I here? Question number three, what can I do? Question number four, where am I going? That's how you begin to think inside the box and really begin to leverage what I would call shifting from average to brilliant. Well, you know, uh, in reading your bio, the first line says that you are a, a thinker. And I thought about that as I was reading over your bio, and I remember Dr. Martin Luther King would take one hour every day and just think. So how important is thinking and going inside, and should we do that every day, and how would that help us to really shift from average to brilliant? First of all, the greatest asset that you have, everyone listening to us right now, this asset is more important than the money in your bank. It's more important than the title that you have. It's more important than anything else that you possess, this asset right here, it is the asset called your mind. Mm -hmm. Because your mind is where your thoughts, your processes, and your vision, and your imagination, and your creativity literally are unleashed. When you stop thinking, you stop living. Because now you're on autopilot. So absolutely, uh, one of the things that I really admire is this whole thing around uh, emotional, what I would call emotional and intellectual stimulation. So, so you know the whole story about the Japanese koi fish. Right. And the Japanese koi fish, you know, is, is put into the, the fish bowl, but then it ends up in the pond. And the whole thing is it's all about the environment that you put yourself in. So when I put myself in an environment that stretches me, it causes new thinking to emerge. Let me put it to you a different way. Sometimes a person can have a vision that is a 50 by 60 in size uh, imagination or dream, but you associate with people that have 8 by 10 thinking. So the question is, do you grow down, go down to where they are, or do you grow up to what you see? Wow, that, that that's amazing. Do you spend a lot of time uh, uh, within your imagination, uh, Simon? Did you see yourself where you are now before it actually happened? And how did you do that? Yeah, it is so amazing that you asked me this question because the answer is absolutely yes. So I, almost some 40 years ago, uh, actually, no, I take that back, 30 years ago, 
had a dream that I was soaring and flying. And I didn't understand it all, but I was like, wow, where's this going? And I was the age, I, I was at the time 14 years of age. And the more and more I began to hold on to that dream and work with it over the last three decades, what I really realized is that what I'm doing now, I imagined it back then, mm. but I didn't understand it, but I held on to it, and I didn't judge what it meant. Because dreams are to be taken uh, figuratively, not literally. So I began to work with the, the languaging in the dream of soaring and flying and what did it mean to me real time. And what I really tapped into is that it took me about 25 years to really come to the essence of what I was meant to be. In fact, I just sent out a note to everyone that follows me on Twitter and and it was I just I said I got to say this and here's what I said you are drawn to who you were meant to be by the magnet in your spirit so mm -hmm. in other words I am pulling towards me the image that I had at 14 mm -hmm. it just took me uh, several decades to get there Wow, that's very powerful. Well, well, let's move on to number three, which is uh, ignite a fresh vision. You know, so many people are saying, well, Simon and Constance, I've just had so much to happen to me. It's just very difficult for me to even begin to have a fresh vision. So the first thing I want everyone to realize is the greatest tragedy in life is not blindness. The greatest tragedy in life is to have sight but no vision so you have the tools to create tomorrow but tomorrow actually starts today so let me give you a practical thought what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail what would you do if no one paid you to do it what makes you come alive those are the questions that immerse you on the path to answering and igniting a fresh vision, step number three. Because when you answer those questions, you're putting your truth on the table. And in putting your truth on the table, you're putting the mirror in front of you and you are inviting yourself to say, wait a minute, I must shift from the inside out. And shift stands for see how I fit today. And when I understand how I fit today, I am honest about today, my today impacts my tomorrow. Because people who practice the Vuja Day moment and really embrace this mindset and this thinking constants, they are willing to do today the things that others won't do so that tomorrow they have the things that others won't have. Right. And so really, for our listeners out there tonight, Simon, today at this very moment, we are creating our future by what we're doing, being, thinking, et cetera. Totally. Dr. Daniel Kahneman, Professor Emeritus at Princeton, says that there are 20,000 daily moments, 20,000 daily moments. Just think about that. Now, I Simonized that a little bit, and I said a moment creates momentum, and momentum creates a movement. I can't get the movement that I want or get to the movement that I want unless I have momentum. But the momentum starts with who am I in the moment? And, and, and everybody listening, Simon, can moment by moment shift and change and, and, and make a decision to intentionally begin to create what they desire in their future. So moment by moment, we can do that, right? We absolutely can. And and what I'm saying is not necessarily hard or revolutionary, but it is hard work, and it takes a consistent commitment to do it. You talked about emotional commitment. What do you mean by that? There's a difference between emotional commitment and rational commitment. Rational commitment is I do what I do because I have to. Emotional commitment is I do what I do because I want to. And when you get the want to, you will get a chance to, and you will find out how to. But it would have never come unless you emotionally committed with your head, your heart, your hands, 
your body, your soul, everything within your nervous system said, you know what, I'm going to follow through because I am committed. For instance, when a man and wife, a man and woman get married, they both make an emotional commitment that I want to be married to this other individual, as versus the rational commitment is I have to do this. Another way to think about this, there's a lot of talk right now around behavioral economics. Behavioral economics says that 70% of decisions are emotional, 30% rational. So when brands and companies look at how do they more connect to consumers, they're focusing on how do I make that emotional connection through story, through song, through visuals, that awakens something within that person that connects them with the brand so that if they have the right state of mind, behavioral economics now, they will buy this product or service or this brand because of how it makes them feel. So this whole thing of emotional commitment is really tapping into how do I feel, how do I think, what am I going after, and I'm pursuing what I want to not doing what I have to. Wow, that's so good. Well, if you just joining me, I'm speaking with Simon T. Bailey, and he is the author of The Vujai Day Moment. I got that correctly, Simon. Shift from average to brilliant. And he's talking about the seven steps uh, to become a shifter. So number four is fuel your mind. I love that one. (laughs) (laughs) So leaders are readers, and readers are leaders. It is difficult to feed if you don't read because you won't be able to lead. Now, I know that sounds like a cliche, but I'm just kind of giving people sound bites and a mental bumper sticker to hold on to. So when I talk about Fuel Your Mind, here's the backstory. I was talking with a client, and I, and I could tell that she was a little distraught over the phone. And I said, what's wrong? And she said, I just asked my assistant to do something. And she told me that she couldn't do it. And she said, I said to her, how is it that you can't do this? You've been here for X amount of years. And the assistant said, you're the first person that that has asked me to think in seven years. Wow. Now, think about the scariness of that in this, this marketplace, that you're the first person that's asked me to think. So when I talk about fueling your mind, it's not waiting for the media to feed you how you should think. When you fuel your mind, you become a critical thinker and begin to say, how do I uh, grow my stock portfolio by increasing my knowledge bandwidth that allows me to stay relevant in any economy? Wow. Wow. And so you you also talk about creating contagious optimism, and that's difficult to do. You know, I don't watch a lot of television, but I have been watching it with the Olympics being on a lot more. So how can our listeners tonight begin to create contagious optimism when there's so much negativity uh, in our lives and surrounding us? Number one, shut out anything that does not move you forward. Literally just reduce giving yourself to it because your, your, your body and your mind is like a software program. Whatever is imprinted on it, eventually it is saved to the hard drive. All right? So, so when I say be mindful of the input, language is the software of the mind, and so how we learn to do what we do is why is how we pick up information, is how we, we grow. So for instance, when you first learn to drive, you learn the language of driving. When you see a stop sign, you stop. When you see a green light, you go. When you see a yield sign, you yield. That's how language was imprinted to us on how to drive. When you think about all of the negative things that are happening around us, those things are being imprinted to our heart drive. Mm -hmm. And as they are imprinted to our heart drive, they impact our mind drive. And when they impact our mind drive, the question we ultimately have to ask ourselves is, am I in the operating system of my life operating at the maximum level? Or what has been saved to my heart drive, i.e., 
uh, the victim mentality, uh, i.e. negative thinking, negative imprints. And how do I delete those things from my art, my hard drive? By first of all, creating a filter. So when the negativity comes in, bounce it off. Got to go, not accepting it, walk away from it, go the opposite way. Number two, how do I create a power phrase? that I begin to cancel the negative by speaking positive. Number, number three, how do I begin to write down what's right about me? And how do I literally create my own infomercial information, infomercial to inform my heart drive of where I'm going and who I am becoming? So what it does is it negates the space that is available in my heart where the negativity would have been saved. Now, you just went really deep on me there, Simon. So uh, so it's a commercial that we are, are emanating from our very being on a daily basis. I, you know, as a therapist for 25 years, I certainly understand, you know, uh, the power of worth and, and the words and experiences that have uh, uh, impacted our lives. So what is your thinking on relationships? And you, you're talking about creating contagious optimism. So what? how can people rid themselves of toxic relationships and then attract those purposeful, godly, powerful relationships into their lives? So when I think about relationships that I want to attract, I must first start with who am I becoming and what do I have to offer a relationship that comes into my life because you ultimately attract what you are and you attract what you are vibrating into the quantum field, into the universe. You just you attract whoever you are, you attract that person. So a lot of people say, why does this person show up in my life? At some level, you attracted them. Mm -hmm. So you have to first of all examine who am I in the moment. Number two, when I think about a relationship, it's not about what I can get, but it's about what I can give. So what are the, th the things that I can contribute to a relationship that will provide long-term value for that receiver? And then the third thing that we should think about as it relates to relationship is how am I relating to the cargo in the ship? When I relate to the cargo in the ship, I follow the cargo in the ocean of life, and wherever that cargo that's in the ship that I relate to, we hit, enter into a relationship. So how am I asking questions and paying attention to the cues and the micro messages that uh, literally bubble up and come to the surface in a relationship. And you also talked about networking. How important is that? And, you know, with social media, do you consider that a form of networking? And what about networking business groups, uh, meetup groups, et cetera? So networking is such a broad topic, but let me distill it down as it relates to the Vujade moment. Number one, in this economy, it's not so much who you know, it's who knows you. And how do they know you? What is your stock value? And are they wearing your brand T-shirt now? You can do that from a face-to-face -face meetup, all different types of uh, niches where people get together face-to-face, -to -face, and those are great. Uh, and there's, you know, the exchange of business cards. But sometimes you have a quantity of business cards and not a quality of business cards. So in order to practice Vuja Day, I wouldn't give out my business card. I would I would limit who I give it to if I cannot help them. Because just to collect the business card and to feel good in the moment and say, oh, that was great, that does nothing for your business. What is it that you can do to help them advance their cause? And when you help them advance their cause, somebody's going to help you in your cause. When it comes to social media, we are shifting from what many are calling social media to social marketing. Uh, if you do not know your clout score, K-L-O-U-T, clout is quickly becoming the credit score for your internet social marketing currency. So 
uh, how active are you within your social media uh, and social marketing um, opportunities? And it's and it's realizing that Twitter is much like going to a reception. At a reception, you meet people, you wander around, and you ask people about who they are, but you're not trying to close a deal. So Twitter is very fast, very, very, very quick. You've got 140 characters to say it and to move on. Facebook is much like going to a dinner setting where you know some of the people who follow you as their as your friends, and you're updating them on the secrets of your life, the intimacy of your life, like what's happening, how are the kids, how's the family. That's your Facebook. Your LinkedIn is that interview. You are always on because you're linking with people that have the potential to hire you or to refer business to you. So obviously you want to keep a very professional front. YouTube is really how do I broadcast my life to the people that care. So in all of your social marketing, the goal is not to be overwhelmed by social marketing, it's to find the one medium that works for you and do that really, really well and not get caught up, oh my goodness, I'm not doing Pinterest, I'm not doing Google+, Plus. I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that. And, and sometimes you become overwhelmed trying to do all of it. Find what works best for you and ultimately you will become an efficient online networker and an offline networker because you understand how to be high touch and high tech simultaneously. Wow, wonderful. Assignment number five is take the wheel. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so so you have a choice. Either you are going to well l- l- let me set it up this way. It's difficult to move a car forward if you get out of the car and you go into the front of the car and you try to turn the steering wheel in either direction. Mm -hmm. You control the car from inside the car by the steering wheel. So the question is, who is controlling and driving your inner steering wheel? So when I talk about taking the wheel, it's about you taking the wheel of your life and driving into your future instead of being driven by everything and everyone. And, you know, you talk about that in that chapter. You talk about how to make a U-turn in your life. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. What do you mean by that? So, a quick story. My wife and kids and I were going to the beach one day, and I went 30 miles in the wrong direction. And you know how wives are. She kind of looked at me, you know, but if you would have asked back then, I would have told you that you were going the wrong way. So I had to make a U-turn. <laughs> so then the next day, I'm sitting I'm sitting out, soaking up a little sun, working on my tan. Oh, do you need a tan sun? <laughs> <laughs> That's a little joke. Everybody says that when they go to my website. And I started thinking, Constance, what happens when people – go in a direction for such a long time, and they never wake up realizing that they could have been at their destination 10 years prior, five years prior, one year prior. So when do I make the brilliant U-turn? And it really comes down to the fact of I evaluate and do a personal assessment and say, am I happy where I am? And if I'm not, what am I going to do about it and make the brilliant U-turn? You know, In other words, you turn, Y-O-U, you turn. You know, that's so encouraging because I know so many, a lot of baby boomers who are not where they thought they would be, and, and I tell them all the time, you have wisdom and experience, and just like you said, all they need to do is make a decision to take the wheel and turn their lives and steer their lives in the direction of what they desire. Yep, Absolutely. Absolutely. So what role does God play in this? I mean, uh, a a person who's trying to take the will, should they be praying? And what role has God played in your life as far as your being successful? Well, first of all, without God, I would fail. Without God, I would be like a ship without a sail. Uh, I ultimately believe that God is the pilot. I believe that he 
wants to lead all of us into the brilliance that he has for us. But I must realize that in the words of Ken Blanchard, when I do not listen to God, my ego takes over and ego stands for edging God out. Mm. So I must include him every day. So for me, my daily rituals is I start with him, I talk to him, I call him daddy, and I write down what he impresses in my heart in my journal. And then I begin to think about how will I show up in the marketplace representing him today so that when I brilliantly shine, it is not about me. It's about him shining through me because people may never see God, but they'll see the God through me. So do you meditate every day, Simon? I'm trying, What's your ritual? My first two to three hours of the day, every day, is spent reading, meditating, writing, and and reading. So I'm I'm reading like three or four books right now, and I I you you sound like me. (laughs) Yeah, I just have such a thirst for for knowledge and information and and growth and development. So I'll start one book and I'm on a paragraph and then it'll jog another thought. So I'll jump over to my notebook, flip back a few pages and say, ooh, okay, that means that. And literally it becomes food for my soul. But what I also realize is that depending on how you're wired depends on how you obtain information. So when you want to go to the next dimension, you must begin to rehearse the language of that new dimension. Because if you don't, you will stay stuck right where you are. So one of the things that I have had to do in my meditation is to constantly rehearse the future. And when you rehearse the future, when you when you are rehearsing that future, all of a sudden, what is in you is literally drawing the future towards you because you rehearsed it. So every morning, I'm going over who I am becoming moment by moment, minute by minute. So give me an example of that when you say rehearse your future. Are you saying I am a, I know you, on your on your website, you say, I'm a brillionaire. I said, is that a billionaire or a brillionaire? Brilliant. <laughs> That's right. I'm a brillionaire. Um, one of the things I say, because I believe in the I am factor. Right. So the moment you say I am, everything in the universe begins to conspire to make whatever comes after I am a reality. So one of the things that I have been saying, and I actually um, really – got this particular idea after reading the story of George Washington Carver, who prayed to God and asked God to give him the secrets of the universe. That was his prayer. Mm -hmm. And God started him with the peanut. And as you know, from that one peanut, he created 300 products that we still use to this day, products and uh, uh, flour and different things. So my prayer uh, and my I am statement has been, I am full of wisdom and knowledge to impact nations, systems, and generations. Wow, that's very powerful. And I say that every day. And just like you, I'm really big on my I am um, declarations. And for my listeners, whenever you say I'm going to have a breakthrough or I'm waiting for my breakthrough, then you really keep that that away from you. Well, Simon, we have about seven minutes, and I do want to cover the last two. Uh, number six is, is it engaging your gears? Yes, engaging <laughs> your gears. So engaging your gears really gets down to that practical. So what am I going to do in order to move into my future? What is it that I need to put in park? What is it that I need to start? What is it that I need to accelerate? So the park is those things I need to stop doing, The start is obviously what are the things I need to start doing, and the accelerate is what activities do I already have in motion that I need to keep going and and bump it up a little bit more. 
What about actions? Uh, you, you talked about an action plan, and, you know, I'm on the Law of Attraction Radio Network, and I certainly believe in that. So if a person doesn't know what they should do, what should they do? Should they, should they just begin moving in the general direction of what they feel they should be doing? What, what would be your suggestion on that? Do something. <laughs> Get some movement. Kick some dust. Walk in circles. Just get moving because so many people in this economy are waiting to be told what to do, and sometimes you have to do what's in front of you. That's just putting a toe in the water to create a ripple. So who can you call tomorrow? What mm-hmm. book can you pick up tomorrow? Um, what 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 product or service or exercise can you do just to get some momentum to your life. And all of a sudden, uh, you discover that a little becomes a lot over a long period of time. Right. And lastly, you talk about restarting your engine. Yeah. So (laughs) once, once I engage my gears, I restart my engine by saying, you know what? I am the person that is responsible for experiencing the Bujade moment. I am the person that's going to jumpstart my life by taking responsibility, asking questions, looking at my relationships differently. I'm going to consider how do I use my time because what I do with my time determines what I do with my life. And it ties into that old Kenny Rogers song, you got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. You didn't know a brother knew a little so, so we I didn't know that. Saying, what is it that I need to let go of? And and so, have you had to let go of relationships? I'm sure that as God really uh, promoted you to higher levels, have you had to release relationships? And how would you do that? You know what? Some relationships release themselves. Thank you, Jesus. And <laughs> and because. When you are moving at such a fast pace and you're going to the next dimension, it suffocates people who are not operating or willing to step up and become who they were meant to be. And what I realize is the higher you go, the less you know, but also the more lonelier you become. Now, when I say the higher you go, the less you know, what I mean by that is you... uh, You don't know what you don't know, but you're open to finding it out, whereas you have people at another level who have to have it all mapped out for them, and they will not take a risk and move into the future because of failure. And the reality is when you're moving to a new dimension, you discover that failure is not final, it's feedback. And you realize that in the dictionary, failure precedes success. Wow, and I think in your book, did you have something in your book about failing fast? Yeah, fail fast. In fact, I was talking in the book, The Bujade Moment, about a company that gives out the, 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 the worst failure award. And because what they want their organization to do is not people to not uh, strive not to fail, but to fail and to be okay. Because how do you fail up, fail forward, and fail through? I love it. I love it. So, Simon, I need more time, but we're out of time, (laughs) and you shared such powerful information. So share with listeners all over the world about how they can get your new book. Uh, You're such an articulate, empowered speaker. How can people contact you to speak at their organization? What is your website, et cetera? If people want to book me to come to their organization and find out about anything that we're doing, then go to simontbailey.com. So Simon T, T for terrific, Bailey, dot <laughs> com. I don't know if you caught that. And, and then uh, they can go to amazon.com and get any of my books. Uh, they are certainly the Vujade, V-U-J-A-D-E, moment. The Vujade moment, Shift from Average to Brilliant is available there at Amazon, and they can follow me on social media. On Twitter, it's at Simon T. Bailey, LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, Simon T. Bailey. And so, Simon, in summary, what would you like to leave with listeners tonight who, who've who been listening to you? What, what would be your final comments to listeners all over the world? When it is time for you to shift 
into the next dimension in your life, you will come to a place where you are uncomfortable being comfortable. And when you do that and reach that point, that is a signpost that the universe is inviting you to shift and have that Vuja Day moment and unleash your inner salmon to swim upstream and create the future you want, not just the future you have. Wow, you are certainly walking in your gift. You are such an orator, you're so articulate, and you're really able to teach people uh, in a profound but, but very simplistic way. And I'm so glad you texted me and told me <laughs> that you you had a new book out because it's been such a joy uh, to have you on the program. And I'm going to strongly encourage all of you to really go to his website. I read his book prior, again, prior to coming on the air tonight and uh, how to shift from average to brilliant. And it really uh, motivated and encouraged me, Simon. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me, and, and I look forward to serving all your listeners. And I, I love that you're Simon Terrific. I forgot about that, and that was such a... <laughs> <laughs> that that was such a wonderful reminder. And speaking of reminder, I just want to remind all of our listeners that the Law of Attraction Radio Network has a wonderful and exciting new website, and you can go there, LOARadioNetwork.com, and listen to all of the other great hosts. And additionally, you can go to my website, FulfillingYourPurpose.com, and you can take a look at my coaching packages. As most of you know, I'm a licensed therapist for 25 years and have coached, trained, and counseled over 10,000 people during my career. And I would love to partner with you to begin to create the life of your dreams. And also, I'm going to encourage all of you to uh, go on LRA Radio Network and take a look at the Cruise Connection. Uh, I'm going to be one of the featured speakers on the cruise in December. We're going to be cruising to wonderful, beautiful Cozumel, Mexico. I would love to meet you in person. And uh, it's just been a great honor to be with you tonight. I'm, I'm grateful to God for the opportunity to serve. And so many of you tell me that I've changed your life, but I want to let you know how globally all of you are my family and you have really radically <clears throat> and intimately changed my life, and I'm grateful to God for you. Well, once again, this is Constance Arna with the Think, Believe, and Manifest talk show saying that God loves you, and guess what? Expect a miracle. Thanks for joining us today on Think, Believe, and Manifest. We'll be back next week with another great show. For more information, go to fulfillingyourpurpose.com.